Have you ever wondered what God's will is for your life? Let me see. You ever ask that question? God, what do you want? <laughs> what do you mean by that? You, usually what we mean is like, where do you want me to go? What job do you want me to do? Where do you want me to live? Who do you want me to marry? What is the next step in my life? Some of us are like, yeah, I've got all those questions answered. What's next? What is God's will for you? I know we have some older teens here this morning, right? High schoolers. You're asking these questions, aren't you? I know you are. What college am I going to go to? Or maybe tech school. What am I going to study? Maybe none of the above. Maybe mom and dad's basement looking really good about now. Should I go to the military? Should I just find a job, do an internship? Who am I going to marry? What if I don't want to get married? How do I know what God has for me? It raises a good question, doesn't it? Can we ever be certain that we are in the center of God's will for our lives? Or are we forever doomed to a certain level of anxiety and uncertainty that maybe we're leaving blessings on the table because we're missing out on the best that God has for us? Because I trust that as we make our way through this brief story in Paul's journey to Rome, that you will grow in your confidence in God's will. That some of the shroud of mystery, that the cloud will uh, begin to clear. That you'll be encouraged to know that the will of God is not a bundle of mystery for you to figure out but is clearly revealed. It may not be as mysterious as you think, at least not the parts that we are responsible for. Although it may take some unexpected turns along the way. Ask anyone who has walked with the Lord for any amount of time, and you go, how did you get where you are today? And there's probably a story of unexpected twists and turns. But rather than shake our confidence, those unexpected twists and turns should fortify our confidence. Knowing that nothing, no matter how unconventional or how difficult, can stop the Lord from accomplishing His will for His people. That, I believe, is at the center of the story that we're going to read together. So if you haven't already, let's open our Bibles to Acts 28. And I know some of you are wondering right now, he told us a couple of weeks ago that we have either like one or two sermons left in the book of Acts. As of right now, uh, at the beginning of this sermon, it stands at two, okay? <laughs> one this morning and at least one next week to kind of wrap it up and put a bow on it. Acts chapter 28, we're going to read through verse number 16. Luke writes and says, And after we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw that the creature uh, saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, "No doubt this man is a murderer, because though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live." He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, a man named Publius, 
who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered on the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting it at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up. And the second day, we came to Petioli. In case you wondered where they are, that sounds an awful lot like Italy, doesn't it? There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they had heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who guarded him. Now, if you recall from a couple of weeks ago, prior to Easter, the last time we were in uh, this text, that Paul along with almost 300 men, including Luke and his friend Aristarchus, spent about two weeks on a ship that was just being driven and battered by a northeastern storm. So for two weeks they ate very little and they slept probably less. But God had told Paul in a dream that everyone on board would be spared, but the ship is going to be destroyed. And so finally the ship runs aground near a beach, but the waves are just starting to tear the back end of the ship apart. So everyone jumps overboard and makes their way to shore. You can imagine everyone climbing up out of the water onto the beach. We've all seen this in movies, right? The shipwrecked person is dragging himself off the, uh, up onto the beach, collapsing into the sand. And everyone is exhausted, they're hungry, they're cold, but they are alive. Just as God had promised that they would be. Verse 1 makes a point to say that they were all brought safely through. And there is a reminder that God's word can always be trusted. He said they would be safe, and they were safe. Every one of them was that they learned that the island was called Malta. We're not told how they learned that, whether some of the the seasoned sailors recognized where they were or whether it was in conversation with some of the natives. It's been said that the island, however, was appropriately named because uh, the name Melita or Melite in Phoenician literally means refuge or escape. So they end up on this island called Malta. Isn't it just like a sovereign god? Look, I'm going to put you in this island of Malta that means refuge and and escape, and it's going to be for you an escape from this storm and an escape from the sea. Luke says that they meet with native people there. The interesting word behind that word native, it's it's literally barbaroi. It's a word that's often translated barbarian, which which means, like in our minds, what comes to mind when you think of barbarian? You're like, yeah, like... (laughs) Yeah, Conan, right? Uh, usually people that are not well educated, usually people that are ruthless and, and there's out slaughtering people. Um, but barbarians oftentimes in, in ancient Rome and into the Greeks uh, literally was used to refer to people who did not speak Greek. So they had another language. These people were native of Malta. They were uh, Phoenician by descent, and so they would have had a a different language. They would have spoken uh, Phoenician language, uh, somewhat similar to Hebrew, but considerably different as well, kind of like maybe Spanish and Italian. Similar background, similar basis to the language, but ultimately pretty different. Um, I heard a a kind of a funny story this week. Someone uh, was put on Facebook that, uh, their um, I don't know, like five or six year old boy uh, who speaks Spanish got together with a cousin. The families were together. Uh, the cousin speaks French and is about the same age. And they were playing together and trying to work out the language barriers. But she said what was really funny is every now and again they would stumble upon a shared word, like pantalone. <laughs> and so they were like, oh, pantalone, pantalone, ah! Oh! And then they would just hugged each other and walked off. There are some similarities across languages, 
kind of like what they probably would have run into with these natives here in Malta. And Luke says that they showed them unusual kindness by making a fire, kind of rolling out the welcome mat. We think, well, how is that such a big deal? Well, I, how thankful would you be for a nice hot fire and maybe a plate of hot food after being drenched by waves and rain for two weeks? There's a picture here of common grace and the image of God that is present in all of humanity. Here are these natives, these barbarians, these pagans rolling out the welcome mat. Let us be a help to you. And folks, there's a reminder here, I think, that we should be appreciative of the good that is done by those who are not believers. Sometimes it seems like Christians today are so suspicious of unbelievers that it makes it impossible to be genuinely grateful for their kindness and wisdom because we're always looking for, well, where's the turn? What are you, what are you really after? We're always looking for the negative. Yet it would be the kindness of these pagan strangers that would get this crew back on their feet again and would make sure they had everything they needed for the rest of their journey. It kind of makes us stop and just consider how often we have seen God accomplish His plans through unconventional or surprising ways in Scripture. Surprising twists and turns all throughout, or even just this book of Acts. Jesus says, hey, uh, I'm going to build my church, but now I'm going away. That's kind of a twist I don't think the apostles expected. We're here to take this gospel beyond Jerusalem. So I'm going to send persecution to Jerusalem. Or Paul, you're going to go to Rome. And in order to accomplish that, you're going to be arrested, you're going to spend two years in prison, you're going to be shipwrecked. And it's going to be the kindness of this non-Greek-speaking barbarian culture that's going to get you there. It's a surprise twist. Friends, we need to learn to appreciate the good that others do. And maybe especially when it is coming from those who are not believers in the Lord Jesus. You never know if maybe your gratitude might open a door to share the gospel with that person. We are jumping ahead just a little bit because Paul, just as exhausted and cold as the rest of the men, no doubt, we find is busy gathering wood for the fire, this example of humble servant leadership. There's something about this part of the story and Paul's activity here that reminded me of Jesus getting up from dinner at the Last Supper to wash the feet of His disciples. This example of humble servanthood, even when you might be tired and cold and hungry, and even when it might be someone else's job, and yet here, Paul, following the, the example of his Lord, busy gathering wood for the fire. And as he does, Luke says that a viper leaps out of the fire and fastens to Paul's hand. Now, many people have kind of come to this part of the story and said, well, see, this, this can't actually be Malta because there are no known poisonous snakes on the island of Malta. So either Luke is wrong, or Luke made up the story, or it's a different island. But folks, I think the simplest solution to this is, we don't really know what the ecology of Malta looked like 2,000 years ago. In fact, tradition tells us that in a similar way, Ireland used to have venomous snakes until who? St. Patrick, right? Right? St. Patrick banished all the venomous snakes from Ireland. Or in pagan culture, it was a different guy. But whether you were a Christian or whether you were a pagan, tradition all points back to someone helped round up or destroy all the venomous snakes in Ireland so there are no more. So maybe Malta had their own snake exterminator or Pied Piper or whatever 
They're like, you know what? We're tired of getting bitten by poisonous snakes. It's a tiny island. Let's find them and let's destroy them. It's not hard to imagine the ecology of such a small island changing dramatically in that way over the course of a couple thousand years. But listen, to the bigger point, wouldn't it have been easy to snap at this point if you were Paul? But I know some of you are like, <laughs> uh, snap is not the right word, right? Dead is probably a better word. Like, I would have been dead the minute I realized it was a snake hanging off it. The venom would not have mattered. It would have been the stopping of my heart. And I get it. Now, listen, I don't have, like, I feel like I don't have an irrational fear of snakes. Like, like I can hold them. I can even, you know, pick them up out of the, and, and transfer them someplace away from the house, so long as they're not venomous, right? I'm not stupid. However, when one of those things pops out of the grass at you, that's a whole different game. I remember cutting the grass as a teenager. I was, I was going along doing my thing, and all of a sudden, this is probably not even this big, but it's just a head popped up out of the grass, and just your whole body tingles. Like I didn't expect to see you there. It's not okay for you to sneak up. So let me know you're here. I kind of feel like if it were most of us, even the bravest among us, and a snake leaped out of a fire and fastened under our hand, some pretty amazing dancing would have ensued. But for Paul, it's been one thing after another. You finally drag yourself out of the water, onto the beach, collapse. You're giving yourself now to serve people by gathering firewood and now a snake bite? And it's venomous? It's like, you know what this is like, right? Maybe not with the snake thing, but you know what this is like because you've had bad days and then you walked into the kitchen to get a bowl of ice cream because that makes bad days better and you stubbed your toe along the way? And you're like, seriously, one more thing. And we're like, Elijah, Lord, just kill me now. I'm done. And I think in those moments, it's easy for us to start doubting whether or not you are actually in the will of God. Especially when they come one right after the other, or especially when they just seem to be prolonged periods of pressure or turmoil. You start wondering, is God trying to tell me something? Maybe I'm not in the center of His will. Maybe it wasn't God's will for me to get a bowl of ice cream. Maybe I should have been after a carrot. Personal opinion, I don't think that's ever God's will for anybody. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't supposed to be eating anything at all. Maybe I'm supposed to right now be fasting and praying. Maybe that was God's will, and He allowed me to break my pinky toe to remind me. I mean, more seriously, maybe it's a hard time with work, and you begin to wonder if you're outside of God's will. Should I have taken a different job? Is God trying to tell me that I should leave this job? Am I outside of God's will? You pray about buying a new car because yours is just time, right? And you find one that fits your needs and it fits your budget and it breaks down after you buy it. And you're like, is God judging me? Because maybe I shouldn't have bought this car. And we just live with this low level of anxiety and hang, hand wringing. Am I going to make a mistake? Did I make a mistake? Is God angry with me? Is all of this hardship the result of the fact that I have missed the mark in some way? I'm not in the center of God's will. And therefore, there is hardship. This was the way the Maltese people were thinking when they saw the snake hanging from Paul's hand. They said, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. In other words, clearly, he's getting what he deserved. It's karma. Karma. Now, in a lot of your translations, justice, the word justice there is capitalized. 
And I don't know if you noticed that as we were reading through, uh, but the reason it's capitalized is that most people believe that this is referring not to justice as in, you know, kind of the idea of fairness or anything like that, but actually referring to a Roman goddess that went by the name of Justice. In the Grecian language, Dike. She was the daughter of Zeus and Themis. If you know anything about Greek mythology, most gods and goddesses were somehow a son or daughter of Zeus because that's how Zeus rolled. The Maltese people assumed that Paul was a murderer and so having survived the shipwreck for a time and avoiding his day in court, justice, the goddess, would not permit him to live. Calvin, in his commentary on this passage, has this to say about that notion. He says, neither was this persuasion conceived of nothing. In other words, this idea that God is judging and that the, the snake on Paul's hand, the trouble, the catastrophes that happen, the idea that God is, that, that is, is, is evidence of God's judgment comes from somewhere important. He says it comes rather from a true feeling of godliness. For God, to the end that He might make the world without excuse, would have this deeply rooted in the minds of all men that calamity and adversity and chiefly notable destruction were testimonies and signs of His wrath and vengeance against sins. In other words, if you see someone survive a shipwreck only to be bitten by a poisonous snake, then it is not only natural, but in some way godly to assume that God got him. In some way, he's getting what he deserved. Calvin is saying that the fact that this is almost like a reflex built into our brain to assume that bad things are happening. And the reason that reflex is there is because we know that I have done bad things, and in some way, I am deserving of God's judgment. It's called our conscience. And it accuses us when we sin against God. And listen, folks, you should listen to it. As a matter of fact, Paul in Romans 14 says if you don't listen to it, you are in sin. It's a warning to you against God's wrath and judgment. So don't just get really good at ignoring it. That's dangerous. But here's where the problem lies. We need to be careful when we see calamity strike someone else. See, I have a conscience that convinces me of my sin, but we need to be a lot more careful drawing conclusions about the calamities of others. Jesus teaches His disciples this truth on at least a couple of occasions. I'm just going to point out one to you right now. John chapter 9. We read not all that long ago. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man, uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There's catastrophe befallen to this man. He was born blind. There must be some sinful reason. It must be some uh, effect of God's wrath upon him or his family. And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents that the works of God, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, Jesus lays out there this notion that calamity and hardship and tragedy might have another purpose besides judgment. So Calvin continues, But here crept in an error almost always, because they condemned all those of wickedness whom they saw roughly handled. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? You ever feel roughly handled by God? Like, man, life is just not easy right now. Though God always punishes men's sins with adversity, yet He does not punish every man according to His deserts in this life. And sometimes the punishments of the godly are not so much punishments as trials of their faith 
and exercises of godliness. Therefore, those men are deceived who make this a general rule to judge every man according to his prosperity or adversity. What's Calvin saying? He's saying, listen, facing adversity or hardship does not mean that you have in some way slipped out of the center of God's will and are in danger of missing out on the best that he has for you. That is not always what that means. And neither does it mean that you are in the center of God's will just because things are going well for you right now. Th- that's the tragic error, error of the health and wealth gospel, isn't it? If you are really in the center of God's will, then God is going to bless you materially and physically. Calvin is saying that's a mistake to assume that just because everything is going well in life, that you are doing well before the Lord. Folks, I think if many of us were in Paul's shoes with our understanding, the way we think about the will of God, I think we would have doubted all the way to Rome whether God was trying to tell us that we had, make an, we had made a mistake in appealing to Caesar. And when you live with that kind of doubt, I think it becomes easy to miss the aspects of God's will that we are actually accountable for. We'll talk about more of those in just a minute, but just as one consideration, one point here, because we've seen over and over and over again through tragedy and hardship, what was Paul's reflex? Share the gospel. Evangelize. Speak of the resurrected Christ. But folks, if you are constantly living with a low level of doubt, or maybe a very high level of doubt as to whether or not you are actually in the center of God's will or whether the hardships and troubles that are coming your way are God's punishment to you because in some way you bought car A and you should have bought car B, you're going to find it really difficult to evangelize because it's really difficult to convince other people or to passionately share the goodness and mercy and gentleness of the Savior when you wonder whether it is possible to ever truly please Him, whether it is truly possible to stay in the center of His will and His good pleasure. If you doubt the pleasure of God towards you, it gets really difficult to share that pleasure with other people. And just as a side note, that is an exhausting way to live the Christian life. But I want you to look at Paul's response. It's very quick, very simple. He shook it off into the fire. There's a a comparison story in Greek mythology that um, has a lot of similarities between Paul's encounter here and another man who was actually um, on his way to fight in the Trojan Wars. He was on a ship and he uh, made a sacrifice so that the ship might arrive safely and when he gets... Uh, They they make a stop off of an island, and when he gets there, he gets bit. Uh, Some traditions say it was on his foot. Some say it was on his hand. He's in extreme pain. He's crying out in pain. The wound festers and smells so badly that the ship he's traveling with leaves him on the island. And they go off to fight in the Trojan War while he stays behind. And Paul just shook it off. unafraid, undaunted, unaffected. I want to quote Calvin one more time. He says, And yet, you must not think that Paul was altogether void of fear. For faith does not make us blockish, that means stupid, as brain-sick men do imagine when they be out of danger. But though faith does not quite take away the feeling of evils, yet it does temper them, lest the godly be more afraid than is meet, or than is appropriate, that they may always be bold and have a good hope. In other words, faith and confidence in the Lord doesn't mean we will never fear. But faith tempers fear. Faith causes us to live in the fear of God. 
which overwhelms and helps to cast out lesser fear. This that Paul had was a God-given calm that was based in a complete trust that God was going to bring to pass his promises. Paul, you must testify to me in Rome. And so Paul was at rest, confident that he was doing the will of God for his life. I don't think we can get away with that. I don't want us just to, you know, shake off this part of the story as Paul shook off the snake into the fire because, the, you know, the more low-level guilt or tension or anxiety you're carrying around with you, the, the greater your reaction when something surprises you, when something painful happens out of the blue, right? The more despair you feel. The more surprise the more unable you feel to respond appropriately, the more difficult it is to, to control your emotions. There is something to Paul's response here that is, that is, I think, telling. And what it is telling us is that he had complete confidence in the promises of God. That was his foundation. And that prepared him well to respond well to the unexpected twists and turns that came with the will of God for his life. It's kind of humorous. In verse 6, it says that the, the Maltese people that were gathered around, they were waiting for him to swell up or just to suddenly drop dead because they know what's coming here. But when they had waited for a long time and they saw no misfortune coming to him, there were no ill effects there was no pain, there was no swelling, there was no festering wound. They changed their minds. Oh, he's not a murderer. He is a God. Well, they just swing wildly from one wrong conclusion to another, don't they? It's a similar response to what we saw to the crowd uh, when Paul healed a lame man in Lystra. When they'd done the, 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 the people, they were like, oh, Barnabas is Zeus and Paul is Hermes. The gods have come down to us. And when Paul and Barnabas realized what was happening, they were like, no, 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 you don't understand. We're men just like you. We're, like, we're here to tell you some good news. And then the crowd's opinion went from, oh, they're gods to, eh, just stone him and get rid of him. Just wild swings from one conclusion to another. Folks, this world is always ready to fall into superstition. So again, one author says, we must beg God for moderation. In other words, don't swing to wild conclusions. Be moderate. Listen, this has come to be a bad word. I know, as soon as I, as soon as I say the word moderate, we immediately go political, don't we? We immediately go to compromiser. It's hard to divorce the term from politics. But Paul's not talking about your voting preferences. He's talking about not falling victim to the worldly pressures that push you to always be agitated about something. We live in a world that is obsessed with superstitions and extremes. Listen, there's more talk today about aliens than at any other time probably in history. Aliens built the pyramids. They gave it advanced knowledge of astronomy to the Mayans. They killed all the dinosaurs. And they're probably the reason we didn't hear from Uncle Al for several weeks. It was definitely not the alcohol. If you have an Uncle Al, apologize to Uncle Al for me. We believe in karma and reincarnation, ghosts, talking to the dead. We are full of superstitions. There's no moderation in our politics or in our opinions on things like mask mandates or climate change or economics or our diets. We are all experts because we read something online and that's convinced us uh, that what we really wanted to be true all along actually is the only truth. And it spills into our personal relationships. We issue ultimatums to our friends and family that say, you're either with me or you are against me. And we leave no room for tolerance or cordial disagreement, even over the simplest matters. And it is wreaking havoc in our churches. We are divisive, angry, anxious, and quite frankly, worn out. 
And what we need, I feel like in many cases, is to stop and take a breath and stop watching Fox News or CNN and read our Bibles. Now listen, make no mistake, there are times to hold firm and to not compromise. There are important subjects that we must not waver on, subjects about which we must be very clear. But there are many, many, many more that do not rise to that level. Someone said this last week, several of us went to a conference in uh, Louisville. One of the pastors there said, there are not thousands of hills to die upon. There's just not. But I'll tell you one. One hill to die upon is that Jesus who is God, came in human flesh and lived a perfect, sinless life. And yet he died a sinner's death as a substitute for us so that we, by his grace, giving faith to us, might have his perfect righteousness credited to our account and be reconciled to the Father. Well, there is a truth upon which we must not waver but on so many other things, what we need is moderation. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 5, Paul says, let your, reasonableness, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Be reasonable. James puts it this way, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then, listen to the next several descriptions, then peaceable, not argumentative, then gentle, Which kind of means you don't have to win every argument. You're not trying to pound people into agreeing with you. Then he says it's open to reason. That basically means you're willing to be proven wrong. And you're going to have a good attitude about it. You're going to be flexible when you can. Rather than dying on every hill. And then he said it is full of mercy. In other words, what comes out of you when you get poked? Is it anger? Retribution? Hate? Frustration? Or are you so full of the mercy of God that when life pokes you or someone pokes you, what comes out is mercy? It's full of good fruits, it's impartial, it's sincere. Folks, that stands in stark contrast to the frantic agitation of our day. Luke continues in his story. There's a chief man, Publius. He shows hospitality. His father is sick. Paul goes in and heals his father and just the whole island starts bringing, bringing sick people to Paul, and he's healing them. It's, it, it just, the, the picture here parallels uh, Luke's account of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. He was in Simon's house, and Simon's mother-in-law was ill with high fever. And Jesus went in and stood over her, and he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And then everyone heard about it. And they brought everyone who was sick with various diseases, and he laid hands on every one of them, and he healed them. Sounds pretty similar. The only difference people have noted, or I think maybe the most important difference to note, is that Paul prays and appeals to the higher power. Jesus simply speaks out of his own authority. Get up. What a God. What a Savior. I've wondered why there is no description here in Malta of gospel ministry. I mean, every stop along the way, things happen, and and at every turn, Paul is said to have shared the gospel. That was his overwhelming purpose. That was what drove him. That is what he saw for himself as the will of God. Several reasons have been given. One is, is perhaps there was a bit of a language barrier here. That made it difficult to share a lot, of, uh, a lot of information back and forth. But it doesn't really explain Publius, who was almost certainly a Roman. 
Some have said that, well, the journey to Rome focused on cooperation and not preaching, but just in the previous chapter, we saw Paul preach two times about God's grace and power. I think it is best to understand that we should just assume that it was happening because it would just be too inconsistent to believe that Paul didn't preach the gospel in Malta. The reality is, some have pointed out, that Luke often follows longer stories, longer accounts with kind of shorter summaries of events that follow. And so we have this long uh, accounting of the, the storm and the ship, and now he's following that up with kind of an abbreviation of what happened in Malta. I think it feels pretty safe to assume that Paul was doing what Paul always did, preach the gospel, and that the miracles were a vehicle for the ministry of the word that he would proclaim. And Paul does not seem concerned one bit about whether all the trouble that he had encountered on the trip meant that he had missed the center of God's will. Or that he was in some way not getting God's best for him. He just keeps serving. He just keeps ministering. And he gets back on a boat probably early in the year, 80, 60, Another Alexandrian boat, Luke tells us, has the twin gods carved into the bow, Castor and Pollux, uh, more descendants of Zeus, sons of Zeus, but by Leda, who is the queen of Sparta, married to King Tyndarius. These two were said to have sailed with Jason and the Argonauts. They were seen as protectors on the sea, those who would bring good fortune on the ocean. Here are the unbelievers looking to superstition again. They made a stop at Syracuse. Not that Syracuse, okay? They didn't get blown that far off course. They didn't end up off the coast of New York. This is Syracuse off the southeastern tip of Sicily. You know where Sicily is, right? Italy's like the boot. Sicily's like the ball that the boot is kicking, okay? And, and, um, Syracuse is right on the, the southeastern tip. They end up in Regium, which is right on the tip of the boot. And then Petioli, right? Very Italian. Petioli this is where they were. They stayed with some Christians from there for seven days. And then Luke records these words, and so we came to Rome. And there were brothers there. By the way, he mentions the... The, the brothers met them at the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns. Like that, these two places are well attested in other historical documents. They were real places. All of this, by the way, the, the locations, the taverns, the, the gods carved into the ship, are all, again, proof to us of how careful a historian Luke really was. So much so that you can take to your friends who say they doubt the authenticity of the Bible and go, man, I've been looking at Luke, like we've been studying at church, and Luke was really a careful historian. Like, this stuff doesn't get recorded in myths and legends. On seeing these brothers in Rome, Paul thanked God and took courage. And, uh, took courage. And, and so in all of this, Paul was focused on what God had clearly called him to do. In all the twists and turns of God's will, God had faithfully brought him to Rome, and Paul seems completely unaffected by all of those twists and turns, all of those unexpected hardships and near tragedies. Paul was doing what God had called him to do, trusting that God would take care of the how and the when and the where. Yet that's exactly where we tend to get stuck, isn't it? We get stuck in the how and the when and the where. And we miss the what, as in what has God called you to be? And I rewrote this last night because I had, what has God called you to do? And it, but I think it's a better question to ask, what has God called you to be? Because the do can lead us right back into those same questions of where, when, how. But folks, those are the details that God promises to take care of for us. Our job is to pay attention to the be. What has God called you to be? What is His will for you? Let me read a couple of passages to help us out. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3-6. through For this is the will of God. You ready? 
your sanctification. Abstain from sexual immorality. Know how to control your body in holiness and honor. That's God's will. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 I give, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know what God's will is for you? Be thankful in every circumstance. How about Ephesians 5? Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What is God's will for you? Sing of His glory to one another. Submit to His Spirit. Give thanks for everything and submit to one another. How about 1 Peter 2.15? For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. What does God desire of you? He desires that you do good. Those are not the kinds of things we tend to get hung up on, though, when considering the Lord's will, is it? The who should I marry? The where should I live? The what should I eat? The what car should I buy? We're stuck in the details, and God never intended us to fret or to worry over those details. Consider Micah 6.8. He has told you, O man, what is good. This is the will of God for you. Do good. Well, what is that? He's told you. Ready? What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. You see, God is directing our attention to the be. What should you be? You should be humble. You should be peacekeepers. You should be just. Be kind. You should be singers of His grace. You should be thankful. You should be pure. You should be submissive. You should be an evangelist. In short, He has called you to be like His Son. To be holy as He is holy. That is where God's concern for you lies and it is where your concern ought to lie. Focus on what you know God has called you to be. And trust that he will take care of the how and the when and the where. Walk humbly with your God and he will order your steps. Doesn't that build confidence? Paul's like, I appeal to Caesar. And he never looked back. He never doubted. He was just busy being who God had called him to be. Trusting that God was going to put him where he wanted him, when he wanted him, in the manner in which he wanted to get him there. Stop fretting the details. And put your eyes on Christ so that you might be transformed into the image of his glory. Let's pray.